Farewell Night de Sana, 19th February, 1976. No one can surpass the Lord Buddha in desiring that people should be good. The teaching that he gave the world was intended solely to bring virtue, goodness, and happiness to all living beings. He did not want the world to be troubled or harmed, which results from wrongdoing due to ignorance of the proper ways of conduct. Because of that, building the Barami perfections to the extent of those possessed by a Buddha, a being full of metta for all sentient beings, is extremely difficult, and so very different from all other levels of Barami. Both the ability and metta go hand in hand. Those who listen to the teaching of the Lord Buddha, either from his own mouth or from the scriptures, and believe in the principles of truth he espoused, will naturally try to correct and improve themselves, so as to be good people. That is to say, anyone who practices his teaching correctly will be good, from the very first person to do so to the last. Regardless of how many members a family has, when each one practices the Buddha's training to be good, then the whole family will also be good. The same truth applies when extended to a village community, a town, or a country. In the end, there is no longer any need to ask about the peace and happiness of such a country, for peace and happiness will definitely follow from the goodness of all the virtuous people who live there. Conversely, the various kinds of hardship and unhappiness experienced in the world arise only due to wickedness. The number of disturbers, literally splinters and thorns, a society has corresponds directly to the number of wicked people living in a community. The more evil there is, the more hellish the world becomes. It becomes a dark place, both in daytime as well as nighttime, and in a constant state of agitation. One needn't go searching for hell, because it is being constructed right in people's hearts, and then scattered and extended everywhere, turning everything into fire. This is very wrong. If people lived in accordance with the Buddha Tamma, these things would not occur. There would be no need for judges, courts of appeal, or even the Supreme Court, for there would be no cases to settle. Each person would have the intention to be virtuous, always trying to listen to reason for virtue's sake. In talking with one another, whether they be young or old, man or woman, ordained or householder, people would easily reach a mutual understanding, because they intuitively understand the nature of good and evil within the heart. People would be guided solely by the wish to see things in the way of reason, truth, and virtue. It would be easy for people to listen and understand each other, and their conduct would be always fair and unbiased, with no need for secrecy. The world, however, does not follow the heart's desire. Wherever one goes, one meets with troubles and complaints about dukkha. Even though everyone studies and searches for knowledge, the whole world remains in a state of confusion and unrest. Because the kinds of knowledge people gain are not permeated with tamma, they serve no useful purpose, and instead end up burning those who use them. Lacking tamma as a support and a guide, as an accelerator and a brake, they just carry on in their own way, yathagamma, without any limit or bounds. By thinking and investigating in this way, you will come to see the value and the importance of the tamma of the Lord Buddha. If you simply try to conduct yourself so as to be a good person, this virtuous practice alone will result in peacefulness wherever you go, whatever the circumstances may be. Even though you are still not capable of teaching others to be good, your heart will be peaceful and happy, which is the correct result from your practice. There are different levels of such peacefulness, but everyone is capable of experiencing the ordinary level if the intention is correct and the right effort is put forth for these experiences to arise. You should not overlook your spiritual potential, for this world can be a happy place, peaceful and worth living in, full of fun and joy. But further than this, those who want to focus on the internal happiness that arises solely within the heart should put their full effort into working towards that aim. 
gradually the subtle type of happiness will arise. Those who are truly interested in the way of Zitta Pawana will take the practice as a battle, a state of combat, and put themselves on the front line. Meditators who are engaged in combat on this battlefield cannot afford to be weak. They must always be vigilant in everything they do. Gradually they will become people who are constantly mindful. Otherwise, they cannot be considered tough enough to be victorious in battle. Such toughness relies on vigilant effort and satipanya, observing your behavior to see if it's going in the right way or the wrong way, especially when the jitta is thinking in a way that accumulates unwholesomeness. Because observation of the thinking process becomes increasingly more subtle and involved, it is necessary to depend on satipanya as a guardian, protecting vigilantly at all times. The stream of the jitta and its various imaginings will not then gravitate to those dangerous and poisonous ideas and emotions which burn and torment the mind. Once the mind has received proper care and nourishment, it will gradually become peaceful, light, and happy without fading into gloominess and dullness as it did before. All of you disciples who have been training here for a sufficient time, please take the Tamma of the Lord Buddha and establish it within your hearts. When the time comes for you to leave, you should not think that you have left your teacher and the monastery behind, for your departure is only an action, a physical activity. The important thing is to reflect on the Lord Buddha's words, Whoever practices Tamma in accordance with the way of Tamma, he is truly one who gives Buddha to the Tathagata. That practice is the way of conducting yourself with Sati, Banya, Suddha, faith, and Virya, diligent effort, everywhere, and in every posture, with strict discipline. Conducting yourself well within the heart, with constant watchfulness, is what's meant by the practice of Tamma in accordance with the way of Tamma and giving Buddha to the Tathagata, the Lord Buddha, at all times. The Lord Buddha continued, Whoever sees Tamma sees the Tathagata. How should we practice so as to see the Tamma and know its truth for ourselves? Simply by practicing the way of Zitta Pahuna. That is the way of practicing Tamma. What is seeing Tamma if not the overcoming of those obstructions existing right now within us, these obstructions are what we should consider as our enemies. They are represented in the first two satya tammas, being Dukkha and Samudaya. We investigate those factors so as to understand their true nature, as it exists in every human being and animal, except the Arahant whom Samudaya cannot enter. The rest must possess those factors to some degree. This is what is called satya tamma. When we have investigated and understood the true nature of those things, this is called seeing Tamma. At that point, it is possible to uproot and abandon all hindrances, resulting in peace and coolness within. This uprooting, letting go, and abandoning of all defilement we call seeing Tamma. It is a gradual seeing, undertaken step by step, level by level, until we finally see the complete Tathagata. Speaking of the levels of attainment, those who have attained to the Sodhapati Magga and Sodhapati Pala can be said to have seen the Lord Buddha at one level, with the heart penetrating to the stream of Tamma. It is the beginning of seeing the Lord Buddha. It is similar to standing in a field and seeing the Lord in the distance. The Sakadagami would see the Lord Buddha closer and clearer, the Anagami closer and clearer still, until finally with the Arahata Pala, one would see the Lord Buddha with complete clarity. The Tamma needed to achieve these various attainments exists within each and every one of us. Constantly taking up the practice in earnest is the same as following the Tathagata and keeping him in one sight. One sees the Tathagata by means of the practice. The Tathagata is seen by way of the cause, which is the practice, and by way of the result, which is successively experiencing the things one should experience. This is like the Lord Buddha who truly saw and knew each stage of the practice before successfully passing beyond it. In truth, the Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sangha are never apart from the heart of those who practice according to Tamma and who, by virtue of their practice, give Buddha to the Buddha, 
the Dhamma and the Sangha. This is the true meaning of Buddha. The way of diligent effort is the way of having a continuous dialogue with the Lord Buddha. Saying farewell and departing are merely actions. They are mere conventions. Departures are an ever-present reality. For example, after sitting here, one departs to sit over there. From there, one returns to sit here. Life is a constant departing. But you mustn't think of departure only in terms of going from this town to that town, or this place to that one. These are linear movements on a physical level. On a more subtle level, there is continual departing in the world of Anitzang. All conditions are impermanent and constantly changing. We can reflect on these conditions so that they become a Tamma lesson using the Delakkana, which is the way of all those who truly know and see. All those who practice the way must rely on the principles of the Delakkana to guide them. Whether we are here or somewhere else, we should always strive to cultivate Tamma for the purpose of relinquishing and eradicating the Kilesas, and for the extinguishing of all Dukkha that exists within the heart. When we are here, we cultivate Tamma. When we move there, we cultivate Tamma. Wherever we are, we practice for the purpose of uprooting and relinquishing. The place does not matter. What's important is the practice of eliminating the Kilesas. For that reason, the Lord Buddha taught the Savakas, Go, bhikkhus, all of you seek secluded places. This is the way to remain close to the Tathagata all the time. It is not necessary for all of you to gather round the Tathagata here in order to have an audience. This is not the way. Rather, whoever has sati, being diligent in all postures, is living and worshipping in the presence of the Tathagata then and there. Sitting around carelessly is not the way to live in the presence of the Tathagata. The Tathagata does not regard the comings and goings of his disciples as essential to communicating with him. The Tathagata considers diligence in practice to eradicate the Kilesas from the heart to be truly having an audience with the Tathagata. This is the gradual seeing of the Tathagata. It is the main point in the teaching whereby the Lord Buddha taught his followers to practice with diligent effort to gradually and successively uproot the kilesas, which are the enemies within the heart, until they all are made to vanish. Then they would all see where the Tathagata really is, without having to look at the Tathagata with dim and blurry eyes lacking in sati. All that's necessary is to completely get rid of all those things which are the enemies of the heart. Then they can take that nature and compare it with the Tathagata to see if there is any difference. Undoubtedly, there is none, for all purified nature is the same. Listen! The essence of the Lord Buddha's teaching is just like this. The training of one's heart and behavior to be good and virtuous is the way of accumulating happiness. When there is steady growth and development within the heart, the result is just happiness. Unhappiness or an incomplete happiness occurs because of those gilesas which obstruct the heart, and nothing else. Only the gilesas can obstruct and pierce the hearts of all sentient beings, preventing them from experiencing happiness and satisfaction. The dukkha and hardship, both internal and external, are mostly caused by the gilesas, and nothing else. For example, when illness afflicts the body, the gilesas will also complain that it is painful here or painful there, causing restlessness and worry to arise within the heart. This concern with bodily illness adds another dimension of dukkha to the heart. The Lord Buddha and Savakas also experienced physical ailments, for the human body falls under the conventional laws of Sammudi, which means that the body is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. The physical body cannot transcend these natural principles. All conventional realities must fall within the laws of nature, and within those natural principles, change is always the norm. However, the heart that totally understands the nature of these things never wavers for a moment. But it is not like this with us. When bodily pain arises, no matter how seemingly small, the heart tends to accumulate additional dukkha beyond measure. The dukkha within the heart can even become greater than that of the body. 
This happens when the heart is infiltrated by the gilesas. When we are absent-minded and careless, lacking satipanya to know what the gilesas are up to, the gilesas can penetrate in every possible way, regardless of time, place, or posture. It can happen any time when the jitta acts without satipanya as the controlling factor. Then it is as if the jitta becomes a servant of the gilesas, unknowingly helping them. How then can the lessons of tamma arise in the heart? The heart can only take lessons from the gilesas as they gradually keep on increasing. Therefore, it is necessary to throw the full force of your sati, banya, sadha, and virya to keep up with the events happening within the heart. Studying the tatu and kanta can make you a noble person. Other kinds of study will not lead to satisfaction because they will not eliminate that hunger that is a normal part of worldly affairs. Only when you have studied the tatu kanta and the heart to completion will the hunger finally be finished, making you fully and completely satisfied. At present, you are still deficient in your knowledge of the kanta and your application of such knowledge in the practice. This knowledge comes from satipanya, penetrative insight into the true nature of the body and mind, so as to understand what they really are according to the principles of truth. It is a process of analysis that separates the true from the false. As long as this knowledge is poorly understood, the result is endless confusion and turmoil within the body and the mind. No other confusion and agitation is more troublesome than that which arises in an untrained mind, where all sorts of problems constantly occur. For that reason, you must study the mind thoroughly until you gain enough knowledge to clear up that tangled web of problems, using Zadibanya to examine and pass judgment at each step of the way. All right, let's study to completion. What is there in the Tadu Kanta? As has been said, the Ropa Kanta is just this physical body. The physical components of a person taken together comprise the Ropa Kanta. Vedana Kanta is the sum of pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral feelings that arise within the body and the heart. This is called Vedana Kanta. Sanya Kanta is memory, recognition, and assumed knowledge about various things. This is called Sanya Kanta. Sankar Kanta is the thought formation created within the heart, that is, thinking good or bad thoughts, thinking about the past or the future without limit. This is called Sankara Kanta. Kanta means group or heap. Vinyarna Kanta is the consciousness that acknowledges forms, sounds, smells, tastes, or tactile objects when they contact the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body respectively and simultaneously reports that sense contact to the heart before it ceases according to its nature and another contact arises. This is called Vinyarna Kanta, being the Vinyarna of the five Kantas. The Vinyarna of the five Kantas is different from the Pratisante Vinyarna. Pratisante Vinyarna refers to Mano, or specifically the Jitta. It is the Jitta that enters into Pratisante Vinyarna just before being reborn into another form of existence. At that stage, the jitta is referred to as Bhattisanti Vinyarna, which is synonymous with the heart. With regard to the Vinyarna of the five kantas, it arises and ceases with the sensations that come into contact with it. When those sensations subsequently pass away, the corresponding Vinyarna also passes away. That is, the acknowledgement ceases with the passing away of those sensations. The Bhattisanti Vinyarna, however, refers to the heart which possesses the faculty of knowing, independent of all phenomena. Even if nothing comes into contact with it, this knowing does not cease. When you investigate the five kantas, do it until you understand them thoroughly. What is not yet understood should be studied over and over again. Keep on digging and analyzing until you understand. This is the appropriate field of work for those who want to eradicate the gilesas, danha, and asava from the heart. This work will result in the destruction of the cycle of vatta, which is the revolving of the citta as it goes on taking birth in various forms of existence, endlessly wandering from birth to birth and always reserving a place in the cemetery. Even before death, it has already made its reservation there. This endless wandering is caused by delusion. 
Due to a fundamental ignorance about the true nature of the kandhas, we become attached to the kandhas of body and mind. As though that attachment were not enough, we carry that clinging forward life after life until we are completely lost in delusion with no end in sight. This will continue to happen indefinitely unless we apply banya to analyze and investigate until we understand the truth and are capable of severing that craving, the cause of dukkha. Studying the Tathukhanta takes you to the essence of the Satsatthamma, which is also the essence of the four Satipatthana. When we investigate any aspect of the Kantas, we find that they are all concerned with the essence of the Satsatthamma and the essence of the four Satipatthana. The body is simply the body as it is, regardless of whether it is healthy or sick. In either case, Rupa is still just Rupa. Illness and disease are merely part of the body's natural state. The Dukkha Vedana that arises due to such bodily changes does not remain for long, so one should see it for what it is. This is the way to study the Kandhas. Do not be alarmed or frightened or saddened with them, for these changes are normal and natural occurrences of Sammuti. Conditioned phenomena must inevitably change in accordance with their very nature, at every period, in every second. Even a second is too long a measure of time to describe this change. Rather, every instant, or continuously, all phenomena are constantly changing. There is no pause, no taking time off for rest and sleep like animals and people do. As for Dukkha, that also manifests itself constantly. It never stops for sleep or rest. People take time off to rest, sleep, and to recuperate so as to feel relaxed and be comfortable, but not so the Satsatthamma and the Delakarna. They never stop, they never ease off with anybody. They follow their unceasing course both day and night, whether one is standing, walking, sitting, or lying down. Every conditioned thing must revolve. This body too revolves, that is, its conditions change. Having sat still for a little while, pain arises. Is this change or not? If there is no change, then why does pain arise? This pain is called Dukkha Vedana. It is an arising condition that we should focus our attention on. Pain is one type of such a tamma, so investigate it in order to see it as it really is. In critical times of bodily illness, we cannot expect to depend on others. Thinking that you can depend on this or that person in times of stress is a misunderstanding, which can only drain your mental energy, leaving you too discouraged and disheartened to think about helping yourself. This wrong understanding is created by the Gilesas constantly whispering their deceptions, and thus cutting the ground from under your feet by means of their trickery. In times of sickness and emergency, you must assume the attitude of a boxer in the ring. Before a boxer climbs into the ring, he takes detailed instructions from his trainer. But once he enters the ring, he can't rely on the trainer any more. Right or wrong, good or bad, dead or alive, he must rely entirely on himself. He must help himself to the fullest of his ability. Boxing techniques can no longer be taught at that time. Entering the boxing ring is synonymous with the final battle when the kantas and the jitta are breaking up and going their separate ways, the time when death is approaching. When a vulture lands on the branches of a tree, the branch hardly shakes at all. But when it springs off to fly away, it shakes the branch until the whole tree vibrates. If the branch is dead, it will probably break off. At the time when the Tatukanta are leaving us, how hard will it shake us? What are we going to use to stand up to this shaking if not Satipanya? Without that wisdom, we will surely be unable to endure, losing our balance and our control. Because of that, we must fight to the very end using the full capacity of our Satipanya in every moment. Don't entertain any thoughts that the body will be destroyed in the fight. You investigate the Thadukhanda for the purpose of seeing their true nature and gaining release from suffering, not to destroy the body. This path of wisdom is followed as a means of helping you emerge victorious at the moment when death approaches. When that time arrives, Dukkha Vedana will manifest itself very clearly. Every part throughout the body will appear to be on fire. 
Internally, the body will feel like a red-hot and glowing furnace. What are you going to do then? You must probe into the pain with Satibanya until you understand the true nature of Dukkha. Once you see that mass of fire clearly with Banya, then turn to examine your heart. Is that red hot as well, or is it only the bodily kantha that is on fire? A heart that possesses Satipanya will not be moved. It will remain cool within the mass of painful feelings that burns like a fire within the body. This is the correct way of practice. Analyzing the Tatu Kanda in this way allows you to help yourself at critical times, instead of expecting to rely on others. This is what we mean by entering the boxing ring. Once you have resolved to do battle, then fight with reason using all your strength. Be prepared to die if need be. It doesn't matter who carries you out of the ring. It is a fight to the end with your maximum capacity of Banya. Do not fight blindly or half-heartedly. Don't fight like a dummy, allowing the Gelesas to strike blow after blow without dodging or counterpunching. That's a useless strategy. You must put your life on the line and fight to win. If you die, then so be it. But don't fight ineptly for lack of that most advanced weapon, Satibanya. Battling with Vedana means investigating so as to see the true nature of pain. Do not force the pain to disappear. Such coercion goes against the course of nature. Instead, you must investigate the pain to see it as it really is, and let it disappear on its own. Even if it does not disappear during the course of investigation, you will understand the nature of Vedana, and so not cling to it. Ropa is Ropa. Don't contradict the truth and assume it's something else. Ropa is body. Body is Ropa. Ropa is just physical body. Vedana is just Vedana, be it Sulka, Dukkha, or neutral. It is just feeling. What is it that knows the body and knows Vedana, Sulka, Dukkha, or neutral, if it is not the heart? The heart is not the same as those tammas. Separate them apart so as to see them clearly with Banya. This is the correct way of investigating such a tamma so that the heart does not waver, even if the body does not last. All right, let's face the battle. Let's see what will disappear first and what will be last to vanish. We have confidence in Satibanya and the truth, the truth that the heart is not the one that dies. The heart is simply the one that acknowledges everything. All right, whatever is impermanent, let it go. The body is impermanent. All right, let it break up. Feelings are impermanent. All right, let them melt away. Whatever is impermanent, let it all dissolve. Whatever is permanent will last and be firm. And what is that which remains? What else other than the one who knows which is the heart? There. It's the one who knows, standing out distinctly all the time. Once you have trained yourself in the way of Zatibanya until you become adept, the results will definitely be like this. But if you are lacking in Satipanya, the heart will become discouraged and weak. All sorts of Dukkha will then converge into the heart, because it is the heart itself that accumulates a Dukkha due to its own stupidity. Weakness can never be the path that leads away from all harm and danger. Rather, it is diligence and hard work, that is, being a warrior with Satipanya. It is these factors that can cause bravery and fearlessness to arise within the heart. Nothing else can bring victory over Dukkha and its causes. Please consider this matter carefully. When you must live at home without a teacher or instructor, you should consider what teaching was it that the teacher gave you for living without him. The teacher that the Tathagata left behind for us is the Tamma. You are with the Tamma with the Lord Buddha and with the Sangha at all times by means of the teaching that you use to train and conduct yourself. These three all represent our teachers. Because of that, you are never without a teacher or his instructions. You live under the protection of Sati, Vanya, Sattha, and Virya, which will fight to the end against those defilements which are the enemies in your heart. How can you say you are without a teacher? You are living with your teacher. 
When you know and understand, you will do so like one who is following in the teacher's footsteps. There is no loneliness, no wavering. There is only firmness and steadfastness in the truth of Tamma. His teaching should be constantly adhered to as a guide within your heart. Then, no matter where you are, you can say that you are with the teacher, with the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha, because the real Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha exist within the heart. Only the Jitta can accommodate the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, and the whole essence of truth. Only the Jitta can know the Buddha, Tamma, and Sankha, nothing else. The body doesn't know. How then can it know about the Lord Buddha, the Tamma, and the Sankha? Vedana doesn't know either. Sanya is just a function of memory that having arisen just disappears without trace. Sankara thinks and imagines and then vanishes. How can there be any essence in these mental aggregates sufficient to accommodate the Lord Buddha? The Jitta is what truly knows and understands the Lord Buddha, until Jitta and Buddha become one and the same. For this reason, you should investigate the Jitta to the utmost. Do not be weak or discouraged. In any case, at the time of death, every one of us will have to enter into the battle. It is something that none of us can avoid. We have no other option but to help ourselves, that's for certain. When the critical time comes, it will not be possible for others to help. Regardless of who they are, whether father or mother, sons or daughters, husband or wife, they can only watch on with affection, sympathy, and yearning. They will long to help, but when the time comes it will be beyond their power. The only powers that can help us transcend dukkha and torment and free us from all bondage are satibanya and our own effort. Nothing else works. So we have to be strict with ourselves and firm at heart, especially when the body is nearing its end. We should focus on developing these powers from this moment on. Then we will not lose control when the kanthas begin to break up, for these aggregates cannot transcend death. No matter how they manifest themselves in this lifetime, they end at death. So the one who knows, knows body and mind until death, at which time the tadu kanta all dissolve, ridding the one who knows of all problems and all responsibilities, and the need for any further investigation. Let's get down to the crux of the matter, right to the essence of truth and reason. Then you will arrive at the really genuine tamma within the heart. This tamma presentation is quite appropriate. May it now come to an end.